My name is Charlene Moser from Sound Sewing, Silverdale, Washington, and the Foff Crave Sewing Center, Lacey, Washington. And this is a how-to class on the Viking Opal 650, okay? So just some things that you can tell right away uh, about your new machine is we do have a slightly bigger throat in here than standard. It is 200 millimeters, so just about 8 inches. The tray is located in the back and can flip up for all your storage. And then you have this wonderful beautiful panel here. What we're going to do today is we're going to show you how to thread it from scratch, wind a bobbin, install it, and how to use all your keys and your functions over here. If you want a how to use your feet that come standard with your machine, we are making a separate video just for the standard feet that come with the sewing machines so that for those that want to just go work on the feet, you can do that. So let's get started. All right, so now we're over with what came with your machine. So just want to apologize. We are filming this in our store, and we do have a lot of background noise going on. So uh, we did run a test, and uh, the test ran good on the the uh, verbal and hearing of this. So hopefully it's coming through okay for you. But just go over the parts that are coming with your Opal 650. Besides the manual, you are getting your buttonhole foot here, and your buttonhole foot is the one that has the plug to go into the machine. Your foot A, which is your standard all-purpose uh, utility foot. This is the one that's on your machine when you got it. Then you have foot B, which is your metal pattern foot, and it has a concave underneath to allow those satin stitches and stitches that build up to flow through. Letter C, which is your manual buttonhole foot. So if you're trying to do um, a buttonhole that you don't feel that you're going to get the performance you want out of the auto one, you would use this one. D is your blind hem foot, right here. And how you see these is this one, the letter is printed on the front versus um, all of them seem to be printed, that one's printed on the front right, but a lot of them are printed on the front left of the, of the foot. The next one after the, the D I have here is your J, which is your edge foot for like doing overcast, oh, let me get down the phone, sorry, your overcast and filming, uh, <laughs> overcast and, uh, finishing a uh, stitch foot and then letter E is your zipper foot okay also you got with it is it looks like these little strips of uh, plastic and they have paper on one side for sticky stick them this is called a gl glide sole and so this actually comes apart and becomes two pieces and anytime you are sewing on foam vinyl plastic or leather or any kind of material that can actually stick to your plate or your foot what you would do is, like on my utility foot, if I wanted to, I could take this and peel off those and stick them right on here so that this becomes a glide foot, that it will not allow those fabrics that can stick to actually stick to my foot and plate and allow them to go through. If it doesn't, if you're still having trouble with leather, vinyls, and plastic, and foam, they do also have a full glide foot that you could get or even a roller foot. I also got with it one or two uh, foams. Um, I noticed the book did say two, but for some reason we only have one with our floor model, so things walk away sometimes. So then we have our large spool cap, which was on your machine when you got your machine, your medium spool cap, your small spool cap, a screwdriver, a lint brush, your seam ripper, and then your quilter's cool tool guide. So um, you, along with that, you would also have received a... Uh, for those who have a touch screen in the Opal series, you would have got a stylus. The 650 does not come with a stylus, and you would have got what's called a multi-purpose tool, which is gray to allow you to help you insert your needles. I had it when I brought it over here to do the filming, and it seems to not be here right now. So uh, just to show you what that looks like, if you were to open up your manual, it'd be this piece here, number five, in your page six of your manual, okay? And it is called your multi-purpose tool for um, oh, that's why I did. it did. It only comes with a 690Q. Now, if I read the book, <laughs> that's why I don't have it with a 650. So that is, we do carry that. That is a great tool to have to have you insert your needles with when you sew. All right, we're going to go over to the machine and learn to thread it up, wind a bobbin, and install it, and start playing with it. All right, now here we are back at the top of the machine. We are going to show you how to wind a bobbin. So what we're going to do is, the first thing we're going to do is on this spool pin, which can sit up or be down, you do want it down for sewing, but while you're threading it, feel free to put it up, and we're going to put the large spool cap on the back. And then we're going to put a felt next. And these always do need to stay on there. These are always going to give the spool stabilization. So then what we're going to do is we're going to put on the spool directly on the machine 
And then we are going to, um, let me just check something just really, really quick. We actually want the thread to come off the spool, I think from the top. Okay, so that, yeah, we want the spool coming from the top. And then we are, so the thread. Then we're going to put the medium small cap, or the next cap on. We want the cap that's going to be, the first cap that's going to be able to fit around this bigger than the spool here. We don't want a real large one if we can help it because we want to be able to keep it as close to the size of the spool as we can. To thread for a bobbin, we are then going to take our thread and there's this metal piece here and I'm going to put directly in there. Okay, so let me see if I can zoom in so you can see that a bit better. Okay, so I'm going to take my thread and we come under here and bring it directly down. And then this piece here, I'm going to then just pop into there and make sure it snaps all the way in. So I've snapped in here. The next thing we are going to do is we are going to put our thread into that hook there. And then with our bobbin, our bobbin can only go on here one way. It won't fit incorrectly. So it will only fit with the Husqvarna or Husqvarna logo up, okay? And then this is the side that has the hole in it as well. So I'm going to thread it from the middle out and that way I get my thread up through the spool, okay? And I'm going to put it back on here. Make sure to put it back in its guide if it's come out because you do not want this thread touching any of the shell. You want being in its little holders so it doesn't cut the shell. I'm going to pop this over to the right and then I'm going to use my foot control to start winding and don't let go of your thread. So I'm going to hold on to the thread and I'm going to just step on my foot control. Once this goes up and down a few times, I'm going to stop and cut my thread flush to my bobbin and then go ahead and fill. Sometimes I will find that it will like to fill one side of my bobbin favorable over another. Sometimes, if that happens, just, just adjust it. A lot of times it has to do with your spool caps that you choose on your your uh, spool itself that will help decide that. So as you start to fill, it will start to hesitate and then that's when you're going to, like I know some mine doesn't want to, there we go, that it will start to hesitate and that's when you notice it's getting full. Okay, so now I'm going to stop and we push my spool, my bobbin to the right and we pull it off and then right here, this guy here is actually a thread cutter. Okay, so now we are going to learn how to thread the machine. So let's come back over here. The thread is still on coming off from the top and I'm going to go directly in here again. But now I'm going to go directly into here. I'm skipping this. So I went up into here and I'm going to come around the back. And you'll see there's a metal flange here. It does not matter what side of the flange you sew on, is uh, thread on, as long as you put it straight in the flange. And I'm going to come around around the nose down here and back up. And then I do have a take up lever right here. Okay, let's see if I can get you guys to see that a little bit better. Okay, Oop, that's my hand. Okay, we do have a take up lever right here. So I do have to go from right to left around it and pull it forward. If you can't get, if it's not there, you don't see it like that, to get, make it come up, you gotta turn your hand wheel to get it to come up, okay? Now, we are going to come straight down and we're gonna get ready to use the needle threader. So let's get set up for that. Okay, so now I'm more zoomed into the bottom of the machine. So here's my thread. And I do have over here on the right hand side above my needle bar, let me take down my needle bar a little bit. So right here is my needle bar. There is a hook right here. I am going to go into that hook, okay? Now we bring this back up. Okay. Now I'm going to put down my pressure foot, which is back here, my lifter, and this needle threader comes down, and as you pull it down, you'll feel it wants to twist. You do want to let it twist. So it'll come down and twist forward, and you're going to go under the bracket to the left, and into the slot on the right. You'll see there is a slot over here. When I go to pull this away, I let go of that tail and I'll make a loop for me to grab. Okay, let's try showing that one more time. Okay, let's see if I can even get a little bit better for you guys. It's hard because it doesn't like to focus too far in. Okay, 
So I'm going to come directly down and twist it in. So it's, it, see how it pivots in? I am going to go, and your needle has to be in the highest position, by the way. If it's not lining up, make sure your needle's in the highest position. I'm going to go into this hook over here, and then there is a kind of like a bracket I go into over here between the two metal parts on the right. Then when I twist the threader away from me, let go of that tail, I'll let the threader go up, and there's the loop. Okay? Now to thread the bobbin. Let's get where we can see for the bobbin. So, All right, so this is about as close as I can get. To thread the bobbin, what we're going to do is I'm going to raise my pressure foot back up just to get it up and get my top thread just under into the back. Take my bobbin off, I'm going to take this plate off and just let you know this little piece right here in the center of my needle plate, or my uh, bobbin cover I mean, that is a magnifier glass. So you can use it to actually see the sizes of your needles and stuff. There is a bobbin in here. They generally do come with a bobbin in there. So I'm just going to take it out. And now, again, just like on the bobbin winder, the H for Husqvarna needs to be up. It cannot go in this way with the logo down. It won't work. It will not fit. If you're using a pre-wound bobbin, you most certainly can, made by pre-wound bobbin companies. It needs to be the L-class size. Okay? But definitely don't use the ones with the cardboard, though. They just don't perform as well in these drop-ins as the plastic lined ones do. But... I like the ones that came with the machine because you can't install them wrong and they, the thread always goes over the top to the left to pull counterclockwise. I would drop my bobbin in. Now you can't just drop it in and go because you do have to put it into its tension down here. Just like when you have an older style machine and you hold the bobbin case to put the bobbin in then install the bobbin case, this piece that you dropped it into on this one is the bobbin case. So you do have to thread it in there. There is a little opening over here that this thread is going to go into. I know it's hard to see. But you go into there and you pull it around until you hear that click. Okay? Then I'm going to push it up and over and then I'm going to put the bottom cover back on, slide it up, and there's a little blade here so when I pull this thread it cuts. Okay? Now we're going to get set up and we will start to learn how to operate the machine. All right, I'm a little ways away from the machine a little bit just so you can kind of see some, oh, <laughs> that was me, sorry. So you can just see some things on the machine and then I will zoom in so we can see better things. Right here, a lot of people mistaken what this knob is for. This one over here on the far left of your Opal 650 is not the tension assembly. This is the amount of pressure that your pressure foot will have by weight. So right now it's on five, or at least it should be when you got out of the box, and you'll see there's a little line by it which indicates that that is the, the standard setting. And when you look, raise and lower your pressure foot, you can feel how much pressure or weight is on that pressure foot lifter. By increasing this number, by changing this number, increasing it, you are making that pressure foot lifter tighter. And you could feel it if you try. And basically, you're putting more pressure or more poundage of your foot on your fabric. If we go the other direction to like the one, you'll feel it's a lot loosey goosey, very, very loose, very low poundage. So you are lessening the poundage on it. And then five is the standard. This is so you can do a wide range of fabrics and change the pressure accordingly for those fabrics. And if you use the exclusive fabric divisor by Viking, it will help you determine where you should start and put that pressure. So we will show you that in a bit. The next one here is this knob. And this one also is set at five and has a dark setting around it. That is because this is your tension assembly, okay? So this is uh, letting you know that tension is good anywhere in that area there. Sometimes I find anywhere between four and six, and this is pretty close to four and six in that range, and um, that the machine really likes its tensions. But sometimes you could be throwing it a really wacky thread or a very, very thin uh, thread or something and you need to change that tension so that's why you'll do it and again using the fabric advisor if you're doing fa uh, particular fabrics will help you determine whether you need to change that into what and of course you always want to try it on a sample first of a scrap of what you're actually sewing on to make sure you like what you're seeing down here on the very bottom left right here and let me get this to work 
right here, this is your feed dog drop. So if I push it over to the right, my feed dogs have gone down. So that would be for like free motion quilting, darning, or embroidery. When I want it up, I pull this lever to the left, but you notice they did not come up. You have to take a stitch. So I'm going to take a stitch with my machine. It's a mechanical movement. So by taking that stitch, by turning my hand wheel always towards me, that feed dog, those feed dogs will just mechanically pop right back up again. So it's just levers to the left. Okay. Now let's get to know the front panel here. So let me get us zoomed into that. This front panel here is your, I call your interactive sewing panel. So basically what this means is while you're doing certain functions, you might want to select some of these options up here. One of which is a start stop key. This one actually can run the machine without the foot control. So just like on your DVD player or you know your iPod, <laughs> I always get iPad, iPod confused, iPod, you have where you can start and stop playing music or, or watching a movie. So that's what this is, same thing. But I do recommend using it also with your speed control. So this actually can change the speed of your machine. When you first turn it on and you use the start stop key, it only knows one uh, level of speed and that's full steam ahead because it's going to go wherever the speed is connect, uh, registered to for that stitch. So for instance, the fastest sewing stitch on any given sewing machine is the straight stitch. So when you first turn it on, that's what it defaults to. And if I use the start stop key and I'm not ready, it's just going to take off. So I can press my minus here and slow down my machine and then use this and feel a lot more comfortable. And we'll go over that when we start getting to the screen here. The next one, a lot of people get confused because there is a start stop and then there's a stop key. The stop key is when I'm doing a decorative stitch. So up on the front panel up here, I have all these wonderful stitches coming across my front panel. And uh, some of them are like bows and there's like a trailer, a bicycle, flowers, leaves, and then some really good geometric patterns up there. Well, when I'm doing those, if I want to make sure my pattern or my sequence completes and gives me a tie off feature at the end, I would press stop, okay? But if I don't care and I need to just tie off right away, that would be fix, all right? So that's how Viking does it. They do fix and stop. The next thing we have is needle down. So this machine will always stop with the needle in the up position, but I do have a key to tell it I always want to stop in the needle down position, okay? And when I use the fix and the stop, I do believe it finishes with it up because you're telling it that you're completing it, you're ready to end. All right, then this one way down here that I haven't talked about is your reverse key. So it works just like a normal reverse key. If you press it while you're in sewing function, it will sew backwards until you release it again. If you press it before you start sewing, it will actually sew your stitches in reverse. So you just gotta be careful and make sure you know when you want to, to select that. Well, let's uh, reset now and I want to introduce you to your sewing screen. All right, here we are at our sewing screen here, and up at the top is your fabric advisor telling you where we have this set at. And right now, by default of the machine coming out of the box, it should be on fabric B, which is your woven medium, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The next thing it's going to do is it has an arrow, uh, a needle with an arrow pointed up right now, which means my needle's always going to stop in the up position. If I was to press my needle down key, my needle will turn to the down, letting you know that you've activated that feature, and now my needle always will stop in the down position. Okay, so that is a very helpful trick to know what, what you're doing. Next thing is it's saying 80. By the needle, it's recommending for the type fabric I have an 80 sewing needle. And I do believe in the manual they do go over that a bit more of what your, um, what's, correct needle for what kind of fabric. If you ever want to know, uh, feel free to come on in. I could easily spend two hours with you on needles, easily. Actually, I probably could spend a day with you on needles. There is a lot to know about needles because there's a lot of variations now. And as new fabrics come out, we have new needles that get introduced. And also with new techniques, we have new needles. So we do have a lot of needles that are available that will fit the machines, okay? So this is just recommending the needle size. This one here where it has the four to six, let's get a little bit closer here. Where it says four to six and it kind of looks like a rope or um, a twisted piece of candy, is that is recommending where your tension should be at, anywhere between four and six. So the machine usually likes to be right at five. Then this one here is the pressure on the pressure foot. So according to the fabric that you're telling it, these two num these all this information here can change with the exception of your needle position. 
to indicate what fabric you're using and what they're recommending. Okay, and that's why the fabric advisor is so nice is you don't have to remember, it's going to tell you. And these are things that you would manually do. You would manually insert the correct needle, you'd manually change the tension, and you would manually change the pressure on the pressure foot. This number is indicating that I am in menu one, stitch one, which is my straight stitch, that's the default. And with that, I am using foot A and show me a picture of the stitch. This is my uh, speed control, which is to be used with your plus minus right here. So when I minus this, I can see right here that my speed control is getting less and less and my plus it, it gets higher and higher. So when I have all the bars full, that means I have the full speed of the foot control. Okay, that means I can just um, I use my foot control like when driving your car and have the full range. But if I minus this down and I'm at half the bars, I can, with the foot control all the way down, I'm only going to go up to the half capacity of the machine. Or when I use my start stop key to run the machine, I'm only going to get half capacity of the machine. Fix is an automatic thing unless we go into the tools to, to change that. And that is letting me know that every time I start a stitch, I am going to get a tie off right in the beginning. It's going to fix and anchor my stitch before I continue. The next thing I have here is my stitch length and my width and or needle position. So the reason why I say and or is I'm in straight stitch and if I had a width that would make it a zigzag. So in straight stitch this becomes my needle positions and I can actually push this and I'm moving my needle to the right in my needle plate or I can push the mayas and I'm moving to the left in my needle plate. And when it's not dark and with 0, 0.0 of this for this stitch, that's telling me I'm at default. But as soon as I change it, see how it's darkened? It's letting me know I have altered it, okay? But when I reselect a stitch or change a stitch, that would go back to default for me. And then this one here, the 2.5, this is your stitch length. I do have an alt menu, but it's going to beep at me because right now I do not have any options to change to an alt menu here. Okay. So what we're going to do now is this is straight stitch, okay? So we are just going to sew that first. All right, so here we're at the machine. I'm going to put my fabric in. I do have my A foot on like my screen told me. And the back of the machine is where we can lower the pressure foot, and then I can sew. Okay, I'm back again. So a little secret about the foot control to make the foot control work is you do have to plug it into the machine. <laughs> so that was always wrong as I needed to plug in the foot control. So now I can just step on the foot control, and away we go, okay? Then, if I come up here, while I'm sewing, if I was to press fixed, let's get this to focus better, there we go. While I'm sewing, I'm going to actually, in motion, press the fix, and it's going to do a tie-off at the end. Then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise my pressure foot, take out my fabric, and on the side over here, you'll find a thread cutter that you go from top down and then I have my straight stitch. Not a straight line, because I'm sewing to the side of the machine, but a straight stitch, okay? So now I'm going to put this back underneath, and let's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and lower my foot, and let's show you how to choose some different stitches on here. Okay, so now I'm back to my screen here, and what we're going to do is, um, just so you can see everything, so my fabric advisor is right down here, which again, we will get to in a moment, and then these are my keypads to select my stitches. Right now I'm in menu one, and that's what told me up here is 1.1, .1, okay? So that dot one, dot zero one, or it's actually one colon zero one, is telling me I'm in menu one and stitch one, which is the default of your sewing machine. So if I wanted to get to different stitches in the menu, let me just bring you really quickly over here, and we're gonna look at the top of this. Actually, I'm gonna take you guys off the holder. And then I'm going to bring you guys up here. So I'm sorry if it's a little shaky because now I'm holding the camera. So up here you have the different menus. You have menu one, two, three, and four. Okay. So the different menus just depend on what you want to do. So menu one is supposed to be your utility stitches. Menu two is guide towards the quilters. Menu three is your satin and decorative. And menu four are your fun decorative. Okay. The book might refer to them a little bit differently, but that's what they look like when I look at them. And so I'm going to put you back in my... All right. So we, I, it was too jumpy, so I had to stop it to put you back in the holder. So what we have done here is now I'm back over here. So you can actually look at the top of your screen uh, of your lid and see your different decorative stitches. Because remember, this is a how-to video, so you should have your machine with you so you could do this with me. 
So if I was in menu one, which I am now, any of my stitches I can get to just by touching my keypad. The numbers of the stitch numbers are listed in the middle of row two and three. There's a set of series of numbers coming across the lid that you can see. So if I wanted to do my blind hem, it'd be stitch 17. So I would type one and seven. And now my thing up here says one colon 17, menu one, 17, and here's my blind hem. It's telling me now I should put on my D foot, and it's still telling me my needle stopping up because that's, again, I don't have the needle down uh, activated. It's still recommending an 80 needle for my woven medium, my tension, and everything has stayed the same, and it's also preset my uh, length and width. Okay, and so then I'd be ready to go. To see how to do the different feet, um, what we do is on each how-to video of your sewing machine, I do go over how to do your buttonholes. However, we do have a separate video just for your feet that came standard with your machine. And so you would go to the uh, Husqvarna Viking standard sewing feet uh, class or video okay that would be found on our YouTube we are at this moment so editing it and getting it up but it will be up shortly and that's as of this moment when the when the video was created so uh, that's what I would do to get a different stitch so if I want to do a buttonhole it'd be number 21 so I type 21 and I'll get a buttonhole so let's show you how to do that because that is different from machine to machine so on this machine it is telling me that I do need my buttonhole foot and right now it is indicating a reverse key right here meaning I'm in a manual buttonhole because it doesn't see my buttonhole foot is engaged and it's true I have not installed my buttonhole foot and so we are going to do that right now so let me get it out and I'll show you how alright so I got the buttonhole foot out for this machine it is the one with the plug okay and it has this wheel so when you get ready to do the buttonhole what you got to do is you got to turn the wheel so that the crown or the white parts in the center of that line the best you can okay so it knows the starting point of your buttonhole the next thing I do is I'm going to raise my pressure foot and I would take um, out my fabric to, and remove my foot so if I pull my foot towards me I can pull that out and I would put this new foot, this the bar of the buttonhole foot in front of the ankle, and then I'm just going to come in. You kind of kind of push it up a little bit to get it on there, and push it back, okay? And then I have right back here. You're going to feel it. You're going to you have uh, sure where okay. I'm going to feel it. it's right here. There's like a square, and there's a plug or a hole in there. And that's where this goes. So it's behind your light fixture. About I'd say probably about a only three quarters of an inch back and that's where this plugs in. Now I'll show you how you know you were successful. Alright so now I'm back at my screen and how you know you are successful when plugging in your buttonhole foot is your screen will change here. Now I'm going to unplug my buttonhole foot to show you what I mean. So now my buttonhole foot's unplugged and if it's not plugged in all the way you will have this reverse key here symbol which means you will do your, your uh, buttonhole manual. If I have it plugged in in the right spot all the way up I actually get this button symbol here. Okay, so that is uh, what we want to achieve. The next thing we are going to do is it is giving us a picture right here of a button and it wants to know how long do I need to make my button hole to fit my button. So what happens is a lot of times when you buy uh, um, Da, da, da. When you buy buttons from the, the store, it come on a package and they will say the size of them in millimeters. Well, that's the size of the actual button itself. You still need to make the buttonhole about two to three millimeters bigger. I always start two millimeters larger than what the package says and then try it out with the button loosely to see if it fits. And if it's a real thick buttonhole button, you normally would have to make the buttonhole three millimeters bigger. Okay, so if my package says 16, like it says here, I am going to up it, um, okay, wait a minute, wait, 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 right up here, sorry, your top arrow right here will change this setting, so I'm going to change it to 18, okay? So the up and arrow here on the very top will control the length of this buttonhole, and I'm not quite sure what we're picking, oh, we're not picking up something on the screen, sorry, it's on my screen. <laughs> um, what I mean by that, if you're wondering what I'm saying, is on my video camera, I see icons and stuff, and it looked like something was blocking this. You guys should be able to see it fine. The next thing is, this is the width of the buttonhole itself, from outside to outside, the full width of the buttonhole. I generally do not change that unless I'm doing teeny, teeny, tiny buttonholes for, like, doll clothes. 
usually I just leave it where I want. This one has to do with the density of your um, of your buttonhole. So how satiny your stitch is that makes the buttonhole. So if you're doing something that is a stretch stitch, stretch buttonhole, you would not want to make that very satiny because you'd want to have some giveness. So how to change these if you do choose to change them is the plus and minus right below them. Okay. So I have changed this to 18 for a 16 millimeter buttonhole. I'm leaving the default at five millimeters in width and the default at right now for the density at 0.4. Okay, now we're going to go back to my machine and I'll show you how to do this. All right, it's going to sew away from me. So I'm going to want to start at the bottom of the buttonhole. So start here, I'll go up, set to stitch forward, go up, set to stitch forward, and bar tack. Okay, so when it does the second up, it does bar tack at the top as well. So you do want to make sure you're on the front end of your, your buttonhole. The other thing is you have a zigzag opening where you know that your needle will go into. That's where you would put the start of the buttonholes right there. Okay, so again, my crown is in the middle of that line. I've lowered my pressure foot. And now at this time, I am going to use my start stop key so that it can just go and be nice and smooth. So we'll do a straight stitch backwards, satin stitch forward, straight stitch backwards, bar tack, satin stitch forward, bar tack, and then we'll tie. And then I raised my pressure foot. Now I didn't watch where my tails were going, so they kind of went everywhere, but that's okay. There is my perfect buttonhole. So if I don't want this satiny, I would increase my density, which is at 0.4, and make it like a 0.5 or 0.6, which would make this less dense. Or I would actually, if I want it more dense, which I would not right now, because this is pretty dense for me, you'd make it smaller, like a 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and then that would add more stitches in here. So to open this is actually pretty easy. You would need your seam ripper to open up this buttonhole. So when you open up the buttonhole, you always start at the bottom here and you insert the, the uh, point of the buttonhole, uh, the um, seam ripper in the bottom, and you cut towards the middle and then stop. Don't go past the middle. Because if you do a long cut, you'll, get, you'll, you'll do that and cut your stitches. Then we turn it around and then I'm also going to insert the seam ripper here at the other bottom and then go up to the middle as well. And now I have opened up that buttonhole. And I'm ready to do my buttonholes. Really simple. Now we're going to show you how to choose stitches in different menus. All right, so here we are back at the machine. Now I have unplugged my foot control, my foot control, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have unplugged my buttonhole foot and removed it from the machine and put it away. So now it's gone back to the default of the manual. I actually don't do manual ones because I find this one does the auto ones so well because the manual ones you have to kind of indicate all the aspect of the buttonhole and today our auto buttonholes are so great we really don't have to do the manuals. If you find that you do need to know how to do a manual come on into the store or give us a call and we'll be happy to help you with that. But now what we're going to do is we've been only working in menu one and so again right now this buttonhole is menu one stitch 21. So I would like to show you how to get to the different stitches. So you do have some keys right here. So right here you have one that's a straight stitch zigzag. And so if I press that, it will come up with my different menus. On your front lid, you'll find that you have four menus. But here, when I ask for the, the stitch menu, menu, I actually have five. And the fifth one is your personal menu. Anything you have saved and put into memory will go there. So to get to the different menus here, I would actually use my side keys over here to scroll scroll through, or I could use up and down, okay, but the up and down will only go up and down, but I could scroll through just by doing left and right. So if I want to do my quilting menu, which is menu two, I would actually highlight it here, and then I'd press OK. Now what will happen is now I'm in two colon zero one, so I'm in the uh, menu two, stitch one. And again, it looks like straight stitch, which it is, and with my A foot. What it has done is with my A foot for stitch one in your quilting menu, it has turned this into a quarter inch foot. It has moved the position of the stitch inside your A foot that when I use the edge of this foot, it is a quarter inch setting automatically. We still do recommend purchasing the quarter inch foot if you don't have one already, because a quarter inch foot also has one eighth inch to quarter inch markings on it on both sides, left and right, for you to have those markings to help you do inset points and binding and all those really uh, intermediate advanced techniques of quilting, which the A foot does not have. But if you need to do a real quick quarter inch seam and you don't wanna go dig out your quarter inch foot, 
hey, there you go. You go into the quilting menu, stitch one with your A foot on, you have your quarter inch. So then I could go in and get my different stitches. So uh, there's a lot of beautiful stitches in here. We have a serpentine stitch, which is number three. So if I just touch three, there it is, serpentine stitch. I can make it longer, I can make it narrower, I can do anything I want with it and sew it out. Now I do want to notice that once I have done that, the foot has changed, however. Now it wants the B foot. So if you haven't watched that video yet about the different feet, the B foot is your pattern foot. So it has a concaving underneath to allow your stitches to flow through that your A foot does not have. Your A foot is flat underneath to allow you to do more utility work like uh, sewing on a jean seam and uh, just your utility work, your, your everyday sewing work. But when you start to play with your decorative stitches, you do need to start paying attention to the foot that it recommends. So the other stitches that I have on here is there is a blanket stitch in here, which is number nine for doing your apple case. So your apple case here, um, oh, I don't have my model with me. Let me be right back. All right, so this is what I was talking about. Now this is a decorative blanket stitch, however, done by another machine, but it's the same idea where you ride the straight stitch edge on in between the, the raw edge of your applique and your, your fabric that you're base your applique to, and it does these beautiful stitches off of it. Now this particular one is doing three up, three down, three up, three down. Um, there's a lot of different applique uh, blanket stitches out there. This one does have a couple different styles. Um, but again, this one was done on another machine, but it's the first sample I could find that could show you what I was talking about. All right. So that is how you get to like menu two. So again, if you want to go to menu three and do the little bicycle, we would actually, actually menu four and do the bicycle. I would go back into my stitch menu here. I would arrow until I got to menu four and I'd press OK, and then looking at my top up there, the bicycle's number 30, and remember, the numbers are in between rows two and three, okay? So the numbers are actually, that's the bicycle, it's so cute. So let me just take you off my stand here so we can bring you up so you can see this better. So here are your, your different menus, and it is listed here, one through four, and then the numbers are in here on this gray part, on this gray bar, okay? So pretty simple to get to your own different ones. And now let's go talk about the Fabric Advisor. Okay, you're a Fabric Advisor. This is exclusive to the Husqvarna Viking Company. So they do have it on their most uh, basic sewing machine all the way up to their top of line embroidery sewing combination machine called the JOS system. It's just kind of like uh, as you go up, it gets more um, advanced. And so when you get up to the top of the line, it becomes, I call it I, the fabric advisor on steroids because it becomes quite powerful, quite effective, and even shows you different techniques. On this machine, you are getting to the point where you are able to pick your fabric as well as the technique you want to do. So this is really cool. So from A through uh, G up here on the top row, you actually have different kinds of fabric. So A starting with the light woven, then B is your uh, medium woven, C becomes your heavy woven, then D is your stretch light, E, e is your stretch medium, F is your stretch heavy, and G is your leather vinyl. So some perfect examples like your light woven, that would actually be more like your silks. Uh, your medium woven would be your cotton polyester kind of fabrics. Then your heavy woven is going to be your, your, your canvas or your jeans. Then you also have your different kinds of weights of knits or stretch. And then the big one is, of course, the leather or vinyl. The next thing you have down below here is your one through seven, which is your different kinds of applications. So number one would actually be your seam. So if I want to just sew a seam and let's say um, I was on my woven, medium woven, which I am right now, up here on my screen, it would tell me medium woven seam because that's why I picked. And what the machine would do is it would tell me what size needle, the tension, the pressure of the pressure foot, and that's what I would have to adjust myself. The machine would then also tell me what foot would be appropriate for the fabric I have selected. But the machine itself would then select the stitch according to what I want to do and set up my, my length and my needle positions. So a good example of that, so that is woven. So let me go all the way uh, over to light stretch. So if I go to light stretch, now I'm on this uh, stitch two of column one, which is more of a kind of like a stretch stitch that's given me, it's like a lightning bolt. And then it's telling me to change my pressure to four, 
to change my needle to a stretch 75. And then my, even though I'm still on seam, my stitch length for this stitch has changed to 2.5 in the length, and my width is a 0.1. So now let's go to a stretch heavy. So the stretch heavy is actually going to be the same thing. The only thing it's telling me to change is the pressure on my pressure foot to a three. Okay, then let's go to leather. Now on leather, it's going to go back to stitch one. I want me to change my pressure to four. Leave my tensions alone. It wants to stretch 90. That one does throw me off because if you are sewing leather, you should use a leather needle because leather, if it's true authentic leather, uh, swallows itself every time it gets uh, pierced. So that's why you need a leather needle is because it has a blade on the side of the, the tip for the leather. So that one I will say does uh, throw me a little bit here. But it does tell you need to have foot H, which is correct, and that my straight stitch, I am on stitch one, which is my straight stitch, but instead of being 2.5, it has lengthened it to 3.0. So by using your fabric advisor down here at the bottom, you can get different kinds of uh, different settings for the fabric you are choosing. The next one I'm going to show you is we're going to go back to medium woven. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go to buttonhole. So I'm going to just select buttonhole, and now we're going to come up here and look. So you do have quite a bit of buttonholes on here. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different buttonholes. Nine if you want to count the eyelet. So it's hard to know what buttonhole to use for what, and that's where the fabric visor comes in. So I picked fabric B, which is the woven fabric. That's what we did earlier, and this is exactly the setting we had earlier, except for I had the buttonhole foot plugged in. Okay, so now if I went to light woven, it would give me the same settings, but now they're telling me they do recommend having an interface put in, and my width has changed and my density has changed. So, oh, also my tensions changed a little bit. So it does change everything there, um, and my buttonhole style has changed. Let's go to heavy woven. Heavy woven, we have changed again. Now we're on number 23, which is the crisscross or the cross stitch buttonhole and everything's changed on there. Light uh, stretch has taken me back to the same one that the light woven has given me with a little different setting. Medium woven has gone back and is actually recommending, this is a new symbol, is recommending a gimp. That is meaning you actually insert a thread into your uh, buttonhole, okay? So that is a little bit more advanced. That will come at a later date. Uh, so that is the stretch medium, stretch heavy, same thing. Everything is pretty close to the same. Actually, that was me. I'm sorry, heavy. Let me pick the right one. Heavy, there we go. Everything's pretty close to the same, but now my width has changed a little bit. And then the one that changes a lot is leather or vinyl. And now you're onto what's called the welt buttonhole. Okay, so that's where the fabric visors he will help you is if you're not sure what to do or what to set up, you are going to want to use your fabric visor down here. But beware, and the reason why I'm saying is beware is as your fabric visor is on, you do it's on all the time, you do need to make sure that if you're just doing everyday sewing, put it back to letter B for woven medium so that you get all the settings correct for what you want to work on, okay? So that is just the beginner of this machine. And again, look for that uh, Husqvarna Viking standard sewing feet class that we are going to put out. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call or come on in and we will answer them. Have fun with your new machine.